later. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to start by talking about mine and Jeremiah's uh, travel in Italy this summer. Um, he's actually not going to be here. They're just getting out of worship right now. So um, sorry to disappoint you. It's just going to be me. Hope you can handle it. Um, <laughs> so just to give you a little bit of background about this trip. <clears throat> Um, we went on this trip with a large group of people and it was, uh, it's not a, a, a trip that's open to the public. It is a private tour done by the 10th Mountain Division Foundation and Descendants Group. So, um, just a little history about that. Uh, in World War II, when the U.S. entered World War II, they recognized a need for mountain and ski troops. And so the 10th Mountain Division was formed. And they trained at Camp Hale, which is located just outside of Leadville in Colorado, um, trained for mountain warfare, um, skiing, rock climbing, all of that. And uh, those soldiers were uh, eventually deployed to Italy. It was towards the end of the war. Um, there were different uh, soldiers already fighting in the southern parts of Italy. The 10th Mountain were, uh, they started their journey in Florence, but they didn't stay in Florence long. They went into the... Okay, we can't, uh, not everybody can hear me, so I'm going to turn the volume up. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Okay. Um. So they they went into the Apennine Mountains. There, the uh, Gothic line of the Germans, or Linnea Gothica in in Italian. Uh, kind of ran us along the spine of these mountains, the Apennines, and I'll show you a map. They're they're not as far north as the Alps, um, and to us, you know, they're they're kind of foothills. Their tallest peak we're at a low is at a lower elevation than where we are right now, um, but it was still mountain warfare, and uh, so that is that is what this trip was about. The, this trip has been going on for decades um, that the uh, veterans would take with their families and, and, and it has just continued. So under the 10th Mountain Division Foundation, which is, um, there is a current 10th Mountain Division, but this is really focused on the World War II veterans. Under that, the foundation is the Living 10th Mountain Living History Group, of which Jeremiah is a member, and then the Descendants Group. So that was our connection. Um, that's how we got to participate in this trip. So it was following in the footsteps of these soldiers. And I'm really not going to talk a lot about that. Uh, there's just not enough time to go into the history of, of this, I really want to talk about our experience on the trip and, and what it meant for us um, and, and the people we met. So first, um, oops, there we go. There we go. So first we did fly in a couple of days early just so we can spend some time in Florence. We spent a day and a half in Florence. So we saw the highlights. It was my second time in Florence, but Jeremiah's first. And uh, we just went on a whirlwind tour, which is what I'm giving you right now. But it's a beautiful city, a beautiful city. And um, uh, we were amazed that even though we tried to learn some Italian, we didn't even need it. Um, so after our whirlwind tour, we met up with the tour group in Florence and moved on. So this begins our tour of um, Italia 2023. This was a trip, the 75th anniversary trip, 
was scheduled for 2020. And so it was canceled for a couple of years. So we had been talking about doing this for several years. So here is, is where uh, we were. This is a, a overview of Italy. You can see where Rome is. We were further north, starting out in Florence. We went to Monte Catini Terme, which is where soldiers would take, um, that's where a town, a small town where they would go for, for healing, hospitalization, or if um, for further breaks. And then we mainly stayed in Lozano and Belvedere, uh, which is here. Lozano and Belvedere is um, in the region of Bologna. And so we were in the region of Bologna and Modena the whole time. And that is in the greater, um, those are provinces, sorry. And those are both in the region of Emilia Romana. So the first thing that we did though, was go to the Florence American Cemetery. It, it looks like a lot of our national cemeteries um, with the crosses and uh, the staging area there. There are 70 acres, 4,392 burials, 1,400 missing, whose names are listed on the wall. And uh, there were 355 10th Mountain soldiers um, buried there. And so when we were preparing for the trip, an email went out that said, Do, are there any clergy going on this trip by chance? Jeremiah said, well, there's two. I said, well, would you do an opening and closing prayer for a memorial service we're doing? I said, sure. And then we learned that it was at the American Cemetery. So it was a very humbling experience. But, um, but Jeremiah did the invocation, and I did the closing prayer. And then everybody present got four carnations, and they went out and placed them on the graves of the 10th Mountain Soldiers, and uh, those who were listed on the wall as missing. So it was a very beautiful experience. So from there, that's when we went on to, as you can see, from Florence up here to Lozano and Belvedere. And we stayed there for a week. And uh, that's really where I wanna focus most is, is our experience there. The first, the first uh, village that we went to is Pruneta. And this is a, a small village where uh, some of the soldiers were housed with the residents there during the war. Um, one of the soldiers came back and he wrote a lot of poems, he wrote letters and took a lot of uh, photography of the town. And later on, they made him an honorary citizen of that town. Um, and so their Independence Day that they recognized was when the Americans liberated their town from the Germans. And so they celebrate that every year. And this really sets the stage for what I wanna share about our experience because the, the heartfelt <laughs> welcome that we received everywhere we went mm -hmm. and the camaraderie was just, it was profound. I had not experienced anything like that traveling in Europe. Um, that as Americans, you know, we were um, we were celebrated so much. Not put on a pedestal. These guys are not put on a pedestal. There was a genuine kind of uh, brother and sisterhood, a friendship and camaraderie um, that was built with these soldiers and their families since then. And, and that was really special. So here in Pruneta, we went and, and there were several speeches. Um, you can see these folks here, they're dressed up in 40s attire. Even the kids got involved, which I just loved. Um, they also had um, a lot of reenactors, World War II reenactors that you can see here. And believe it or not, a lot of these reenactors dress as American soldiers. So that was that was really neat. Um, and so here's the village, and here's these reenactors. It's almost like stepping back in time. I mean, Jeremiah could tell you what's wrong with all the 
uniforms and all the mistakes being made. But for someone like me, like stepping back in time, it was really neat and just a beautiful village. Um, and uh, here are, if you can see the black and white photographs on the buildings, these are those photographs that I was talking about that soldier took. And so they, they've mounted them to the walls of these buildings. Um, and they shared some of his letters too. And then we went to what's called a pro loco, P-R-O-L-O-C-O. -O. Um, and we learned that these are in a, most of the villages. They were in all the villages that we went to. It's kind of like a community center. It's a building or a structure, but it's also the villagers who come and put together um, you know, celebrations, festivities, cook the food, serve it, that sort of thing. And so this was the first of many meals where we um, we gathered in the Pro Loco and ate local and home cooked food. And um, and it's just a lot and a lot of conversations, um, some more speeches and uh, a lot of wine, a lot of locally made wine and they just bring out these bottles and when they're empty, they bring more. <laughs> so after Pranetta, we went, we went further up um, to our base camp, which was Lozano. And again, here, the welcome was profound. So they had these signs posted everywhere. It says, welcome to the descendants and friends of the 10th Mountain Division. Um, this is the hotel where we stayed, where they had American flags, Italian flag, and the 10th Mountain flag. And then um, at the end of our stay there, they made this big cake um, celebrating our friendship. And uh, so we stayed here for a week. Lozano is uh, a ski resort. They have a ski hill there. And um, it, again, not a lot of foreign tourists, but a lot of local tourism. Um, and from there, we, we had three busloads of people and we just went out into the surrounding hill towns and the villages. And so this just gives you an idea of, of what that looked like um, geographically very lush and forested. If you've seen pictures of the area in World War II, there are no trees. Um, there was, be, between not having a lot of, of money during the time, the, a lot of the residents would have to chop down trees for firewood, and then the, the shelling um, and, and whatnot uh, took care of the rest of the foliage. So it's all grown back beautifully. But this is also just gives you a sample of the architecture. It reminded me more of like an alpine village and some of the other parts of Italy that you might see um, further south. <laughs> So what we did um, when we would go to each of these towns, well, a lot of speeches um, and welcomes by officials and mayors of the town. We did uh, a lot of um, laying of wreaths at the different at monuments. Um, we paraded through the town in a couple of instances and some of the villagers would come out and uh, watch the parade. So again, just that 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 welcome and friendship and celebration. And uh, this is a letter that was written by the proprietor of the hotel that we stayed. Um, and he wrote it and posted it as we were checking out on our last day. And it says, I am very happy to have had you as guests. This week flew by quickly. I think people's destiny is written, but today I'm here, I was born, I live in freedom, I work, I have wife, daughter, and son, and as you have seen and heard, sometimes we sing together. All this would not have happened without the sacrifice of your fathers, of your grandparents, or of your relatives who sacrificed themselves for our, and therefore also my, destiny. Honor to the 10th Mountain Division forever in our hearts. And it's just, it's, it's just a beautiful relationship that has developed. And so that was what was most meaningful to me out of this experience. It's not, it wasn't a touristy experience. 
um, it was a deep experience that that I'm taking away from this. Um, it was really powerful. Um, here, it some more monuments that we've seen. And if you see the guy in red, this is Joe from Utica, New York. Uh, Joe from Utica uh, is now an Italian. He has Italian ancestry and moved there permanently and speaks Italian. Um, and he is a member of their Red Cross. Uh, the I always get the words backwards, but it's Croce Rosso. And uh, so they're kind of the mountain rescue in the area. And if you see behind him that statue, this is a close up of it. This is um, another tearjerker. This is an Alpini, which is the Italian mountain troops reaching across to the <laughs> mountain uh, troop. And so, um, that not only was it just with the villages, but with the Alpini that this that this special relationship developed as well. Here is a real life Alpini. <laughs> this is Frank the Alpini. That's genuinely how he was introduced to us. Uh, Frank the Alpini is 98 years old. Very active, is a volunteer for all kinds of things. He was everywhere, even on our celebration nights when there was dancing. I mean, he was getting down. I was like, man, those are 98-year-old babies doing that. Um, he was fantastic. Um, over here is another uh, person who was alive during World War II. He was six years old during the war. But he has written down a history from his memories, from talking with all the villagers, from his, you know, parents, um, grandparents, their memories, and uh, he was also everywhere. He's kind of a, a town celebrity in Lozano, and uh, his nickname is Banana. So he goes by Banana. I'm not sure where that came from. <laughs> In all of these villages and celebrations, we were fed lavishly. And uh, so this is just a couple of the, you know, what the Pro Locos came to. Emilia Romana is the region where uh, Parmigiano Reggiano cheese comes from. Modena is where balsamic vinegar comes from. Um, so there was a lot of local taste that we got to indulge in. And um, and the meals would all start with, on, on the left-hand picture, these round breads that were also regional called tagella or crescentia and meats and cheeses, all locally made and processed. Then would come a pasta course. And in this uh, particular town, they served a stewed wild boar because those deep forests, there's a lot of mushrooms and truffles and wild boar and venison. And uh, as I said, lots of wine. Um, fortunately, we were active as, <laughs> since we were eating so much. So this is one of the hikes we did. This was a short one where we got, um, it was a steep climb, but we we got to, to see some of the foxholes and on the, the left there is a German bunker. But here's a foxhole where you can see uh, an original picture of, of the guys there. Um, an important climb that we did uh, is uh, Reva Ridge. So Reva Ridge, it was the first battle that these guys engaged in where they climbed up to overtake, um, this is a very short version, overtake uh, Germans who were, um, who were staged there. The Germans at that time had control of the whole Apennines and that, that Linnea got to go. Um, and so they climbed in the middle of the night and um, surprised them, took River Ridge. And so we got to do that hike. And uh, it, is, it, it is tough and we weren't even scaling the wall like, like some of the guys were doing. The other one was Mount Belvedere. 
Um, so this was an, another important gain that the soldiers did. Um, so here we are hiking that one. And you can see a bunker on the left here and a monument. And of course, it was it was a 30 minute, 45 minute hike, steep. And some some people, a lot of people took cars up there because they could. Um, they they were shuttled up there. But um, but it, it was it was a pretty tough hike. But of course, there's more food <laughs> and wine when we get to the top. <laughs> You, we can't gather without food and wine. So from there, um, just to wrap this up, from there we went, um, you know, we're somewhere over here to where the red pen is. And so the soldiers, um, after after they they really captured that that line, then it was a race to the Alps. Um, they crossed the Po River Valley. Um, we tried to cross the Po. It took a couple of hours to try and figure out where to cross it. So we didn't actually cross it. We got near the Po, um, but uh, drove through the Po River Valley into um, the town of Riva del Garda, which is on the northernmost tip of uh, Lake Garda. And, um, and so the, the soldiers were really trying to to, to get there, to, to push the Germans back across the Alps and finish the job. And like I said, this is just a few days before the, um, the war ended, actually. Um, so what happened at Lake Garda, if you see these tunnels, Germans were blowing up the tunnels. Um, there was a duck, an amphibious vehicle that, that went down, um, killing 24 out of 25 10th Mountain soldiers on board. And so this tiny picture here is, is a wreath. We, we laid one last wreath um, where it went down and that's a beautiful story in itself. Um, and the rest of the time was free time. So here we are, um, Lake Garda is just stunning. So if you ever get a chance to go, I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a medieval town so you can see down kind of the original medieval city. And uh, it was a, a beautiful way to, to end our journeys there. Look at those, I mean, look at that. Those are the Dolomite Mountains in the background. And I was really happy to get some pizza. <laughs> so that's our journey in a nutshell. There's so much more I could say about it, but I really just wanted to convey that spirit of it, um, because that's what's really staying with me. Um, I think I've, I, I don't, I, I think I've shed the pounds that I gained. So the, the spirit of it all is what's staying with me. Um, do we have time for questions? You want to? Any questions? I have a question. Yeah. I really wanted to get private and say that you're part of the lineage. And so I'm curious of what some of your knowledge is the lineage there. Okay, so Shirley's question was about, it was a private trip, so she's asking about the lineage. So Jeremiah does not have any ancestors um, in, in Tenth Mountain. His connection is through the Living History Group. So he's one of the historians and who does the displays. Um, I will say that uh, there were a couple of people from the Colorado History Center that were on this trip. And it was the first time that they that they've done that. Um, and and so, you know, we befriended them a little bit. And and uh, Jeremiah and and this guy, um, he's the di director. It's a temporary position to set up a permanent 10th Mountain display at the History Center. Um, they were talking about what they would do differently if they created a tour that was open to the public and how they would focus more on the history at the 10th mountain um, and spend more time in those areas there. And History Colorado is interested in doing that. So it's not gonna happen anytime soon, but there is conversation about doing a, a trip there. I think that would be fantastic. And how often is this trip? 
This trip um, happens, I think it's like every five years or so. One of the reasons why we felt a sense of urgency to finally do this after years of talking about it is because this is the first time no veterans were able to go. Um, and so as they, most of them have died or just unable to do international travel, we just wonder how much longer the descendants are going to keep doing it. But there were grandchildren, and I think in some, uh, some cases, even great-grandchildren who are on this trip. So they might keep doing it. Any other questions? All right. Oh. Yeah. yeah, they came back to Colorado, started the ski industry, started Nike. Um, their legacy lives on in many ways. All right. All right, let me get this. <laughs> While he is switching up our, our slideshows, um, just for sake of time, I, I think um, it's good enough that I'll just start introducing my pilgrimage on the Camino. Um, the Camino is, well, the, the pilgrimage route. Uh, it has been a pilgrimage since the ninth century. But in some ways you could say it starts uh, all the way back to the time of Christ because it is centered around, which I'll uh, tell a little bit more in a moment. Um, it's centered around St. James. James was the brother of John, the sons of Thunder, the sons of Zebedee. Um, oh my goodness, I'm not even saying anything personal. I'm starting to crack. <laughs> um, who were some of the first um disciples that Jesus called out of the Sea of Galilee. And um, James was considered St. James in the Catholic Church, the patron saint of Spain and the Iberian Peninsula. Um, okay, okay, so we're up. So the Camino de Santiago is also in English, the way of St. James. And the history there and I'm not going to go into the long, kind of long story of it, but let's, the history kind of starts, tradition says, with a hermit back in 814 um, who found off somewhere on the Iberian Peninsula bones that had been married, that buried and determined somehow that they were the bones of St. James. And the Catholic Church consecrated the bones and they ended up burying, reburying these bones in Santiago de Compostela, which is on the northwestern tip of Spain, and a cathedral was built, and ever since then, um, it, it has been a major pilgrimage route, um, and let's see how to do the screen, how do you advance it, just screen to screen. Um, you hit these here, oh, okay. but I also hit that S. Yeah, that's fine, since I'm going to go to the next. So, so you can see here, and hopefully that's not going to keep going. That's just, oh, yep, this. Okay, let me go back. Okay, so you can see here uh, the route we went on, and I'll show you a closer picture in just a moment. But the route we went on was the French Way or uh, the Camino Francis. This map represents all the various um, multiple pilgrim routes from all over Europe that you can take all ending at the cathedral in Santiago de Compostela. Uh, you can see there's multiple ones constant, you know, consisting of thousands of miles of, of trail that, that you can that you can go on. Um, so this is a little bit closer. And we started here, you can see the blue, uh, the blue arrow. We saw, started in Saint Jean Pierre de Port. Um, and we traveled all across, following the line, all across northwestern Spain to Santiago to Compostela there, um, going through several provinces along the way. Uh, you start in St. John de Perry Port is France. It's on the border of France and Spain, right in the Pyrenees Mountains. 
And so the first day or the second day, depending on if you break up that hike, you can either go over it all in one long day or you can break it up. We broke it up um, where you go over on the first first day over the Pyrenees Mountains, go over the pass and you cross into Spain. Um, <clears throat> so just some interesting tidbits about St. James. St. James was the second um, disciple believed to have been killed. The first being Judas, who died, of course. He was the first one to have been martyred. And uh, he was actually martyred in Jerusalem. But then the long story, which we can talk about later, he, his bones supposedly ended up in Spain. Um, um, let me see. I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. So since the Middle, middle Ages, it has been considered one of the three great pilgrimage routes. So there's the Camino de Santiago. There is, I can't even, it's in Latin or Italian, the Via Francia Giano or something. It starts in, in Canterbury in the UK and it travels all across Europe to Rome. That's considered another great pilgrimage route. And then of course the third is the, the pilgrimage route in the Holy Land. But these are the three great pilgrimage routes uh, that have been since, since the Middle Ages. Um, those pilgrims who started way back and it really picked up steam in like the, the 10th and 11th centuries. Um, and pilgrims who left their home to go on pilgrimage, they, they were called for a number of reasons, personal reasons, but also because the Catholic Church told them, if you take this pilgrim pilgrimage and you make it all the way to Santiago and you get your, your Compostela, which is your certificate of completion, then for you good Catholics who make it and survive the journey and, and, and get your, your certificate of completion, that awards you less time in purgatory. So uh, it became a great, a great spiritual act for them. So for them, they started from wherever they were, they started their pilgrimage when they left their front door. And so pilgrims today we really think of the, the, the fact that you don't really start your pilgrimage when you get over to Spain or, or Portugal or France or wherever you're going to start from. You really start when you start planning your trip and you leave to go um, because you're really pouring yourself into something that's very, that's very, very precious. So, but of course, back then, it was a lot less safe to travel. And so uh, these pilgrimage, pilgrim routes were developed over time because it developed a, a safer route for pilgrims to not just walk by themselves, they would end up walking in groups. Um, albergues or hostels is, is what they are. They're, these albergues developed along the routes that, that were specifically geared to care for pilgrims. Um, convents, monasteries, uh, municipal uh, facilities, all of them grew up to have a place of respite and care for pilgrims along the route and gave them a safer version. And we still, pilgrims still stay in albergues today uh, and some municipal buildings and, and different places like that and hotels. I mean, so that we have hotels now, so some, some stay in there. Um, some pilgrims who left home, they never made it back home. You know, they either, they got injured, maybe died along the route. Some people just stayed. They, they got so inspired, they stayed and started some sort of ministry along the route where they were. So there's many, many thousands and thousands of, of feet who have traveled this journey over the years. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to start the slideshow, um, and I'll just stop it every once in a while and talk about a few things. Um, just some some details that I get, we get a lot of questions about this. Was how far did you go? Where well, the route we went, the Fran French way, the Camino Francis, it's not the original route, but it is the most popular route that that pilgrims take um, these days. Not everybody, in fact, a lot fewer numbers start from Saint John. Um, it's it is about a five hundred dollar five hundred dollar I wish. Um, <laughs> 500 mile journey across Northwestern Spain. Um, a lot of people, in order to get your Compostela, your certificate of completion, you have to show, and this is ancient, this has been going on since the beginning. You have to show that you walked the last, at least the last 100 kilometers straight through. 
And so there's ways that you you show that there's these stamps. Um, oh, where did I? I didn't pull that out. Oh well, I've got some some show and tell over here later. You you get what's called your credential, um, and you get stamps. And every you know every day you get at least one stamp as you're walking along, which is a great kind of keepsake as well to show where you travel. Once you get to Soria, if you're on the French way, Soria in Spain is 100 kilometers from Santiago. After that, you have to get two stamps every day. They've had to do that since they were, you know, for, since the Middle Ages. And once you can show you've walked those last 100 kilometers, um, then you can get your Compostela. A lot of people come over and start the, the uh, Camino Francis in Soria, because it takes time. Not everybody can take you know, 30 to 45 days to, to walk. Uh, so from Soria, you can do it in seven to 10 days, uh, those last 100 kilometers. So a lot of people start there or somewhere else along the way. Not everybody starts all the way back in St. John, but that's what Ryan and I did. We walked all told, because once you get there, you don't, unless you get a cab or something, you have to walk everywhere else to eat, to do your laundry, to to go to the pharmacy, which we spent a lot of time in the pharm pharmacias, um, especially early on in the trip, going and getting things to take care of your feet and, and your, well, in my case, hives, because I <laughs> broke out of hives at one point. I had to go get some things. I forgot about that until I was reading through my journal. Um, so what we're going to do, we started at St. John, and what I'm going to do is start the slideshow, and then I'll stop and just tell you some of the some of the special things. So I'm gonna sit down just because I'm a little taller than we. I don't want to get <laughs> I don't want to get in people's way. Um, one thing to keep in mind as you're kind of going along the journey, the Camino Francis is kind of considered a journey of three phases. Um, the first phase is considered the physical phase. And unless you're a top athlete and maybe not even then, even no matter how much you train, and I trained a lot, no matter how much you train, walking you know, 13 to 15 miles day in, day out, it gets, your body feels it and has to adjust. And it takes a couple of weeks or so for you to get what they say, your Camino legs. And so the first third of the trip, they say is the visible, you know, that's the physical part of the trip. The second part of the trip, the second third goes through the Masetta, which is kind of like walking through Kansas, if you can imagine. <laughs> so it's not, I mean, it's beautiful in its own way, but it's not like you have all these stunning vistas to, to distract you. And so that becomes the mental phase. And I can tell you, as you're walking along and, you, you know, the first eight or nine, 10 miles kind of feel like they go by like that. And then way off in the distance, a mile or two down the road, you can see the village that you're going to. Those last two miles feels like it takes forever to get to the, to get to the town. So the second third is, is the mental and then the last third, uh, once you're coming out of the center, coming back into the mountains all the way to Santiago, is what they say is the spiritual, and I the spiritual phase of the journey. And I can really attest to that. Your body is stronger. You, you, you have survived so much already, and you can really, it's really just almost like meditation and, and walking with God along those last. It's really stunning. So, so we're starting in St. John, St. John Pierre de Port. So our first day before we started, we were walking around town and um, we were trying to find, there's usually a pilgrim's mass that sends pilgrims on their ways and we wanted to find where the mass was. And we walked into this albergue and we met this young couple, Abby and Ryan there. They were starting the next day, just like we were. And they didn't know, it turns out there wasn't a pilgrim mass that day. And so we didn't get to see a pilgrim mass, but uh, we met, we did met, meet Abby and Ryan, which was a significant meeting because they came to, became dear friends. We're old enough to be their parents. And yet we just made a, a wonderful connection with, we, we just kept seeing them all along the way. This is a prayer that was in the cathedral in St. John um, that, is a prayer for the pilgrims. Almighty God, you are always kind to the ones who love you and open to the ones who seek you with a sincere heart. Have mercy on your servants who are making this pilgrimage and lead their paths according to your will. Be their shade in the heat of the day and be their relief when they get exhausted. Grant them the courage to accomplish their walk under your protection through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is um, the first Camino Way marker that we saw on the road going out. That's the ancient bridge. When you cross that bridge, you're considered to have started your actual walking the Camino. These are just some shots 
um, of St. Jean Pierre de Port, us in our hotel room right before we were about to take off and starting our climb. That first day was only like six miles up to the Albergue, but it was a climb. I, I called it the climb. What did I say? The climb cramps and <laughs> climb cramps and, and connections because that was the only day, that first day out that I forgot to drink too much enough water. And so here I was climbing up, up, I mean, straight up <laughs> for six miles and then my legs cramped when I got there that afternoon and I was doubling over and these people that we never knew probably wondered what was going on when Brian was banging on my legs when they walked in the room. But I didn't have that problem anymore. This is the refuge, uh, Orison, which is on going up on our first night. We stayed here, a uh, beautiful place. You'll see some, that's our communal meal that night. We met people from all over the world in that one room. Uh, some of them we still stay in touch with. The next morning, we knew God was with us when God gave us that sunrise. There were so many wonderful horses along the way, but I finally told me I needed to stop taking a picture of every horse in France and Spain. So. We followed shells and yellow arrows all the way to Santiago. That's where you knew you were on the right path. That's Brian having a discussion with a goose. Um, this is in a, um, how many, can't remember, 13th century little church that we went to. Um, that bell is the oldest still, the oldest bell in existence in Spain still that is still in operation. We got to ring that bell up in the bell tower. It's just beautiful. It was just looking over the entire countryside. This is in Pamplona. We learned Pamplona was the first big city we came to, and we were so tired and exhausted, and realized we realized it there that we hated walking on concrete. <laughs> Just fields and fields of yellow flowers. I think that's mustard, but I'm not sure. This ridge, this is high up on a ridge. You'll see how high up in the next picture. You can tell how high we were. You go up and over a ridge and then down a very steep, sketchy grade. This is, um, there, there is two, you can see the wind turbines in the back, back there, but there's some right above where we were taking this picture and you can hear them all the way up, hiking up. And it felt like the whole, you know, woof, woof, woof. and it just felt like the Holy Spirit was just, getting into your bones uh, with the wind that was blowing from those turbines. This is, a, if you look at this, these statues, you'll see the one back on this side uh, is in the garb of a medieval pilgrim, and you keep going, and it's up to more modern-day dress, just so how many people. It's called um, uh, Alto del Perdon, or Height of Forgiveness. It's a deeply spiritual place um, on the Camino where people for years have just been kind of starting early on in the journey of, of starting to let things go. Brad had a thing with statues and putting his hat on statues. And we had to get pictures every time there was some sort of statue. This is in Puente Lorena, leaving the city. And that's one of the many old ancient uh, medieval Roman bridges. That's the Queen's Bridge coming out of the city. And that's me looking like a medieval pilgrim. I don't know what that orb is above my head. I decided it was an angel. So, it was just, everything was just stunning. One of the many cathedrals we went in, and they just get better from that. This is our first rest day in Estella, and we rounded rounded the corner coming into town. And here was this. This is a, a ancient palace, or not ancient, but medieval palace. And, and you can't see them all close, but all these statues. I felt like I had walked into the Lord of the Rings or something. It was just it was just took my breath away. Um, and then right next to it is the ancient uh, medieval church that was there, and that's where the kings of the Navarra province used to go to be crowned. And that's the, the inside of that church. That is a little wine, a little bodega a wine dispensary outside in the open that anybody can fill up their shelves. It didn't have any that morning. We were so early and it just spit out a couple of drops. Didn't taste very good though. So that is a 10th century castle up on the hill. Yeah, 
yeah, sales, yeah. I got so, you say that it's so funny there were some pictures that we had when we take a selfie we tried to do at least one selfie every day and there was one it captured the rise because Brian would say something or or do something and it would either like I'm going I can't believe you just said that or it ignore me or something and I'd be going and there was one picture that caught he caught me doing that one and it just cracked up when we saw it because it was just so how everything was so everything you know we were smiling in the ones we usually show there's the there's the trail going Yes, they had cairns. I'd already been dealing with blisters, which I was managing up to this point. Now about on this day, I started dealing with pain in my lower legs, which turned out to be tendonitis. Um, they just got worse and worse and worse. This is in Viana, a beautiful village high up. They've climbed up high on a hill and beautiful stunning cathedral uh, in that village. This is uh, our friend, the uh, Abby and Ryan, the other young lady on the end is, I can't remember her name. She was from France, but Abby and Ryan that we had met way back in St. Jean Pierre de Port. And that day as we were walking to Viana, that we just ended up on the trail at the same time. And we just made a connection and um, just became really good friends. They are travel bloggers, which means they travel the world and stay in different places and write, write about it and do video blogs. What a, what a life, huh? There was something about that that really grabbed me when we were walking into the Bronio. <laughs> no, that's not a real cow, <laughs> but it was cute. That's the, the cathedral. There, there's, there's an Iglesia, a church, and a cathedral in Logroño, and that's that's one of the this sort of ancient meaning. Doors, oh, I should have taken pictures of doors all throughout Spain. The, the doors were just phenomenal. A lot of the cathedrals had crypts uh, that were, people were buried. A lot of graffiti, some really remarkable graffiti as we walk through. There's one of the graffiti artists. I did ask her if I could take her picture. And she said, sure. So we're going into the Rioja, the, the wine country uh, here. You can see all the vineyards. That's a little shelter that's built for farm laborers who need to get out, you know, shelter or take a break. That's in Nahira uh, after our long, our longest day, about 20 miles of hiking that day. And there you can see no shade, one tree for miles and miles. Brian found as soon as I caught up to him, he started walking again. I'm going, wait a minute, you know. So. <laughs> Balloons in the morning. Ooh. This is in Belorado, some more of the beautiful artwork on the side of buildings. This is an ancient ninth century um, or medieval ninth century. The only thing left are ruins of a monastery. It is a goat. One of those babies had escaped, and one of the girls was saving it. This um, this is interesting, y'all. Some of you, his, you know, you archaeological buffs might know of this. This is Atapuerca over in Spain. There's an archaeological dig. Um, they found several years ago um, remains of um, showing human remains dating back 1.2 million years. It is the oldest archaeological discovery of human remains in the world and in Spain. And the, one of the oldest um, places of where they saw um, where there was human cannibal, cannibalism. <laughs> so I don't know if, I don't know exactly all that, but it's, there's evidence of human cannibalism in those, those archaeological places, which is a little creepy. This is going into Burgos. Oh, the Cathedral in Burgos is just amazing. And about this time, I was limping. This is the tundra uh, of the cathedral. And then I got some close-up shots. You can kind of see some of the detail. It's hard to see from the floor. But we had a rest day in Burgos. And I told Ryan, if I'm going to make this, um, I'm going to have to see somebody. So I went to see a physiotherapist named Arun in Burgos. And she had magic hands. So and by the time I started walking after our rest day, I didn't know to hurt again until like three days out of Santiago. We were entering the Meseta, 
uh, still some rolling hills, the poppy fields just covered in red. This is a medieval convent, the ruins of a uh, convent or monastery that for 500 years served the needs of pilgrims. Uh, and then the order that ran it, uh, they they dissolved and it went into ruin. And now, even though it's still, it's, it's just ruins, but there is a small albergue in this, in this, um, in these ruins, they sleep about six people, and our friends who are behind us by day or by day, I think, Abby and Ryan, the young couple, the day before, there were so many people when we were there that some people would get to where they wanted to stay and they couldn't find beds, and that was a, the day that happened to Abby and Ryan, the day after we went through, they ended up walking like 42 kilometers, which is pushing 25 to 30 miles. Uh, and they finally stumbled onto the convent and nobody was staying there because it has no electricity, no, no, no hot water. And the little Italian guy who was running it, they, he explained that. And they said, do you care? And they said, we don't care. We, we just did it. We were so exhausted. Uh, but this was a glorious day walking the field, poppy fields through the, through there. This is Castro Goritz, a wonderful village that is also a castle up on the hill. I felt like I'd walked into one of my historical novels, romance novels I used to read about, read when I was younger. Just a random medieval cross sitting in a field. Oh, this is funny. I started taking a picture of funny signs. This is, I know that I know nothing, but the second bar is cool, Socrates. <laughs> I, maybe Socrates said the first part. I did it. Daddy said the second part. I get a sense of the Masetta, just nothing behind that tree. Some of the many, many statues we saw as we walked through, more modern and yeah. more. Yeah, that, that's what you felt like. That is a um, part of the ancient Roman wall that's actually a gateway into the old, old city. Um, and I'll show you the wall, and but that's the remains of, of the doorway, the gateway going into the city. Let's see the, the remains of the wall there. This, we're in Lyon. You can see the glorious cathedral in Lyon. Um, I'm wondering, hold on, I'm going to see you now. If I can't, oh, maybe it's the next one. And going inside the cathedral, most of them don't have a lot of natural light. Leon's cathedral was built to bring the light in. It was supposed to make you feel like you had walked into heaven, and you really did. I mean, my jaw dropped. I couldn't, I mean, it was just so, so stunning. Now we're going to get tired of me taking pictures of stained glass. It's supposed to be the second most kind of stunning cathedral after Notre Dame in Paris, which of course we couldn't go into because it's still under renovations after the fire when we were in Paris. That is where the choir sits. That that I don't can't remember the name of what you call those places where choir sits, but that's uh, it's a crypt. <laughs> Those are bodegas. They are wine cellars that are built into the hills. Because I am a country girl at heart, you're going to get cow pictures. Some of our, some of our yellow arrows. This is an old mill. I don't know when it was built, but it was an old grain mill, and we stayed there. It's now a place for pilgrims, and it it's right over the river going under. It was beautiful. And that's a little town we stayed in next. And we got stayed in that little courtyard. And that, that Sala, she's four years old, and she and Brian blue, blue bubbles. That is, okay, uh, okay, I'm not going to go back to it. But y'all saw those hanging pictures. We walked into that little village, and we're going, what on earth? <laughs> it, was, it was like these creepy, it was like Halloween it had just been hung up there and they forgot to take them down. And yet it still said Buen Camino, which is the greeting that everybody says, Buen Camino, good Camino. Um, it was weird. <laughs> um, beautiful, beautiful, stunning field of poppies and whatever those blue, I don't know if they were blue pines or what they were, but just took your breath away. On the hill, we're coming out of Masetta, starting, <laughs> starting to go toward the mountains again now. This is going into Astorga. That's a little monkey that greeted us going into a story. Oh, 
you don't see what that sign says? It says Denver, Denver, exit only. <laughs> so we just go through that. I guess we've been home and we've gone through that doorway. <laughs> Beer, because your friends just aren't that interesting. <laughs> That is the city hall in Astorga. You'll see a close-up of this clock. It's the little characters there. Watch, watch them with your little uh, mallets there here in a second. Our room was right there above the canopies to the left of that building. It's, it's a wonderful plaza. Evening. I don't know if she did. That was me. She did. <laughs> That's the cathedral. Just beautiful. This is Cruz de Ferro, uh, iconic place of sacred, um, say, since oh, 2,500 years when the Romans were going through here. For some reason, this hill became a place where it became symbolic of letting go of something, whatever you need to let go of. And so for, for, since ancient times, people have been bringing and, and, and depositing rocks. Uh, since the pilgrims started in med medieval times, they, we often bring rocks from home. If you remember, to symbolize something you're carrying, and you come to this 30-foot wooden pole with this iron cross on top, and you lay your rock down, and it's symbolic of laying whatever you're carrying with you down. Um, I, we captured as we got there that morning, this, this woman, I, we don't know her story and it's a very private moment for her. So, but she, she, she came down from laying her rock and praying at the base. She was just crying. So the, the sense of that she had had some kind of great loss, just the way she was with the people that she was with. And so it was very, very moving. I took a rock this Phyllis Worley gave me this rock after a children's sermon last year or sometime, and I carried that rock. Uh, God is my rock, and then Ron did the one underneath. That was this is as we're going through the mountains, we're hitting some of the. You can't tell it here, but these are some of the steepest up because we're going to the highest point on the Camino, then we're coming down off the highest point of the Camino. This day, we stopped at a little village midway coming down, and the rest of the way was like, it was, we had so many warnings, like if it's wet at all, do not go down this path because it's treacherous. People break their legs. People have, you know, people get hurt here all the time. Don't do it. And we woke up that morning and it was raining cats and dogs and the rains was going sideways. And we're looking at each other going, we haven't taken a cab yet, or are we going to take a cab? And all these pilgrims where the cabs were coming up to the albergue and picking everybody up and kind of do, do it, are we going to do it? And we just decided to go for it. And because we're stupid, but, and we also live in Colorado, so we're used to rocky paths, right? And so we headed out and it was still raining, but not as hard. And it was one of the most glorious days for me, I, I mean, I got at one point about probably this, you, can, you can't even tell the trail that, but I got at one point, I turned around and Brian and I just said, I am so happy. You know, it was just, it was just my soul just felt so filled and there was hardly anybody on the trail because everybody else was taking cabs from the mountains. So uh, it was glorious. And we even saw a double rainbow as we were coming down. So, a bow in the clouds. This is a, a medieval Knights Templar castle uh, in Pomferrada, and uh, it's a ruin now. It's a national monument now in Spain. It's just kind of breathtaking. It's like the quiet the mind and the soul will speak, which is what I need to do because my brain. <laughs> okay, so we're walking through this village in the mountains, and we, we're seeing this cute little house. You know, it's just all these cute little old, old places to live, and we walk by this little cottage, and we're both going, is that a cute little cottage? Then we're going, what is that window? And we zoom in, it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> it was like, oh, and I thought I see this. It just cracked us up. This young lady was going solo by herself, pulling a cart with her little dog in it, all by herself. We saw her for about three or four days we were on the trail at the same time. That last village was hilarious. It was at the base of the biggest climb of the whole thing. We were going up to Oveguerrero, which is at the top of uh, the Leon Mountains, one of our, our final rest day, a village of 50 people. We crossed um, 
yeah, we crossed um, into the Galician province on that day, which is where Santiago is. It was, we were so psyched because all these young people that passed us at the bottom as I was adjusting my feet and my, my shoes and this and that, and they would stop exhausted in the tiny little villages going up the mountain. We just blew past that and we just <laughs> all the way to the top. They never caught us again. We just said, we rock, we old people. This is the morning sunrise the next day. It was one of my favorite spots. The, the way the weather patterns would come in, the cloud cover would come in below us and it looked like a sea, but it was just, it's one tree trunk. That's one tree trunk. Yeah. That's a reflecting pool with a, a sculpting of a, a shell. Of all the amazing things that I discovered on my Camino's journey, the most important was discovering myself. That little goat was talking. I mean, he was bleeding and talking. <laughs> it was so funny. This made me think of you all. The the heart carved out of a carved out of a tree trunk. That's the hundred yeah. kilometer marker. Hundred kilometers left to go. This is a place we stayed. They had their own vineyard, and we sat there on the on the river reservoir river there and had their wine. And then they wouldn't let us go back to our room until they gave us their homemade limoncello. It tasted like gasoline, but <laughs> we drank it. I'm a little dizzy. But this is a a, a rario. Uh, it is a mouse-proof grain barn, and they're all over Galicia. This is the the little Galician villages. It's a very agricultural province, and so you walk through the villages, and. It, it, you can smell <laughs> it's an agriculture and the barns and the cattle live there in town on the edges of the little the little cobblestone streets with all the people and we run into cattle drives you know walking through and we'd be stepping over cow poop and they'd be passing us and it was glorious so this is a ninth century castle uh we rode some old rickety bikes to get there because it was about a mile from where we were staying and um That is octopus popo. Galicia is known for its octopus dishes. Malide, which is where that was, is the octopus capital of the world, I guess. That little, that little home was built in 1523. It's been owned by the same family for 500 years. They've been serving pilgrims for the last 50 or so. It also has a Michelin-rated restaurant in it. So we ate well that night. We saw these wonderful snails all along the way. Arrival into town. The rainiest day of the, the, the rainiest day of the whole trip was the day we walked into Santiago. There's the cathedral and us arriving there and shot a tube inside the cathedral. This is a cathedral rooftop tour. So this is on top of the cathedral um, that we took. All in Spanish, but it didn't matter. And this, I'm not going to read the whole thing, it's too long, but this was in the cathedral. Just want to read you the first couple of paragraphs. It reminded me of Romans 12. It says, it's a pilgrim's prayer. Although I may have traveled all the roads, crossed mountains and valleys from east to west, if I have not discovered the freedom to be myself, then I have arrived nowhere. Although I may have shared all of my possessions with people of other languages and cultures, made friends with pilgrims of a thousand paths, or shared albergue with the saints and princes. If I am not capable of forgiving my neighbor tomorrow, I have arrived nowhere. And it just goes on from there. I don't read the whole thing, but it just, it was so beautiful. Thought. And that, I believe, is the end of it. So. It was 47 days, uh, about five or six were rest days, which we really needed. 
Um, I did my, my tendonitis came back for some reason, I don't know why, like three days before we got into Santiago. And so rather than, I told Brian if I had to stop somewhere, I would, but instead I just, when we were at that, that old 1523 uh, lodging, there was a physician who was walking the Camino and there was another lady who was having to stop her walk. So she was just going because she had to think plantar fasciitis done so bad that she couldn't walk. So she gave me these heavy duty, basically ibuprofen that the, her, the doctor had just given to her. So she gave me a sleeve of those and he gave me some Tylenol. And as a physician, he said, just combine the two, take a couple of the, the ibuprofen and a couple of the Tylenol at the same time and, and it'll help you and it won't be so hard on your on your gastrointestinal liver and kidney and stuff. So that's what I did in the, the last three days. So it was just, it was beautiful. So, any, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Did I buy this top? Oh, no. No. <laughs> no, no, this was a gift from my sister. I, I was wearing my pack in this morning. This is my pack that that I wore, I'll tell you a little bit about some of these things. Um, and I had it on my back and I was gonna say, I, I did not wear this when I was on the, well, I had two hiking pants that were convertible into shorts or pants, um, basically two short sleeve merino wool shirts and a couple of long sleeves. Um, and that was it. Uh, you know, I, I had a, I had our, my hiking boots and I had some, some chaka sandals to wear off trail. Um, this is the pack I used. It's a 24 liter. Had um, carried everything we needed for the day. This is a shell pilgrims who, for, for since the medieval times, uh, the shell is the symbol of the Camino, and pilgrims since medieval times have been putting shells in the backpack and, and identifies them as, as pilgrims. This shell, I had two. I got one in. Um, St. John before we left when we checked in at the pilgrim office, but this one was given to me by Judy Stout. So some of you know that Judy has walked from Saria to the last hundred kilometers from Saria to Santiago, and this was her shell. And so before I left, she gave it to me to use. And so this is the one I carried with me on my pack the whole way. Uh, you'll see up here, if you come and look, there's two different things. They're in Latin. One is the Compostela and one is just a certificate of completion. And they're up here. This is the guidebook that I used. Uh, Briarly, the author, has been helping pilgrims find their way for how oh, many, many years. And he literally just passed away. He was in his early 90s. As early as this past year, he was back on the Camino update, updating his book. Uh, his daughter is taken, but he just passed away from cancer just in the last month. Um, but this is an invaluable resource. And initially, I didn't know if I was going to journal because back when I was so exhausted, I, thought, I tell myself I'm going to journal every night, then it's become like homework. And I'm going to be, it's going to be like work, you know, and I just don't want to commit to that. But then um, council here, they gifted me with a few things uh, that they gifted me with these earrings. I didn't wear these during service because I didn't want the earrings to be too distracting, but because they're really long, these, these shell earrings and a St. James pendant, but also this little jour journal to take on, on the way. And I did every night from the day I left Colorado Springs, I journaled and, and I am so grateful for this gift because when I was going back getting ready for this, it was, oh, my heart was so full, just reading and remembering things that that I hadn't remembered. One of the things that I re that was wonderful that on the trail, we were three or four days in, we were going from Zubiri to Pamplona, and it was so muddy. I mean, muddy and slippery and wet, and we were tired and exhausted, and I was not in a good mood. <laughs> and, and we got on this, it was so slippery. They had somebody had laid down these flat boards for people to walk over this money. And I'm just like, just like all in my head, not in a good head space. And all of a sudden, I looked down and we are out in the middle of nowhere in the woods. Nowhere. I don't think there was a farm anywhere near. And I looked down at this beautiful cream colored honey and cream colored cat with these beautiful blue green eyes just walked out of the woods and walked up to me and just started rubbing against my legs and I'm looking going where did you come from you know it's just the most marvelous thing and I just and I wrote in my journal 
I decided that God inhabited that cat and was showing up to give me encouragement and reassurance because my mood just slipped it just for the rest of the day. And, and it was like God showed up in a cat that was nowhere where a cat should have been, especially a cat that looked that clean, and, you know, because she was, she was beautiful. Um, my pack, my sticks, if you ever go on a long walk, there are people who don't wear use sticks, wouldn't go anywhere without them. So, um, in here, which I meant to pull out, but somewhere in here is, I think I brought it anyway, was I meant to put it in my credential, my, my credential, which I had to get stamped. One of the most blessed day, and I think it was after we left Soria, we left and right out of town, there was this tiny little chapel and it had been converted into an artist studio. It's a tiny little chapel right outside of town. And the artist in residence was there. And so we walked in and I was looking at some of his artwork and Brian said, give me your, give me your credential and I'll get him to stamp it. And uh, so I handed it to Brian and I was looking at everything I looked over. And rather than stamping, just using his stamp, he sat down and this artist started painting me, painting. The, he, he did me a little original artwork in my credential, and, and it is so precious. And so when Brian got a little bit jealous because, you know, he was the one, <laughs> he goes, wait a minute, <laughs> wasn't he supposed to do that in mine? <laughs> but no, it was just like a, a precious gift, and if I dig it out, and I can show it to you, but I don't know if that works. Any other questions? I, oh, I am so glad you asked that. Well, yeah, we saw, you know, certainly the Spanish children. And there's something, I'll tell you, there's that. And the Spanish communities, it's not like here. We don't have our little cliques that we go and do or stay behind our walls. When the day is over or it's the weekend, the Spanish people are out in the neighborhoods. They are in the community. They are, so, you think it's Christmas every, every day, you know. So we saw kids like that. But as far as the Camino, yeah, uh, in fact, the night I saw the communal mill, our first night in Odyssey, um, there was a, a Korean family there. And the father, I don't know how long he went, but we passed them for several days, and, and they had a two-year-old, and he was carrying his two-year-old son on his back. We passed another family that had a husband and wife and two young boys, and of course they couldn't, every rock they had to pick up and throw and every, you know, and I'm thinking, they're never gonna make it there. <laughs> but yeah, so there were families, and you hear about that sometime, you know, but we, we ran into two or three that had their children with them, so. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Well, Leanna, thank you for coming, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your Sunday afternoon. And, and, and oh, Judy, Judy wanted me to ask, we do need to strike the room and clean up, so anybody who can hang around just a little bit longer and help take out tablecloths and put away tables and chairs, it would be a blessing and a gift, and we would thank you. No, <laughs> Thank you.